Intuitively, the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to l when f of x is close to l as long as x is close to a but not equal to a. And in fact, mathematicians were comfortable with this informal definition for a couple hundred years because, well, it worked. But some non-mathematicians were quite critical, and in the 19th century, a more formal definition of limit emerged. So the key step in this mathematization process is to put a definition on what we mean by close to. So we might remember that x and y are close if the absolute value of their difference is small. And so we get our formal definition of limit. Now, we want f of x to be close to l. So we can make the difference between f of x and l less than some error, epsilon. We also want x to be close to a. So we can think about x and a being some distance delta apart, absolute value of x minus a less than delta. We also want x not to be equal to a. And so we can guarantee that by also requiring this absolute difference be greater than zero. Now we also have these epsilons and deltas floating around, and so we need to determine which came first, the epsilon or the delta. And so a basic principle in life is start with what you want. In this case, since we want f of x to be close to l, then we want this epsilon to be our starting point. So we might phrase it this way. For any epsilon greater than zero, there is a delta where if x is close but not equal to a, then f of x is close to l. For example, let's prove the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared is equal to 4. So definitions are the whole of mathematics. All else is commentary. We'll pull in our definition. So we know our starting point is we want the absolute value of x minus 2 to be between 0 and delta, and we want to end with absolute x squared minus 4 to be less than epsilon. So we can work a few steps back from the end, and we see that we have to do something with this absolute value of x plus 2. So remember, you can assume anything you want as long as you're explicit about it. So let's see what we can do with this absolute value of x plus 2. Since we're looking at x close to 2, let's consider some interval around 2, say, how about between 1 and 3? Then on this interval, we have. So in this interval, we can replace the absolute value of x plus 2 with something smaller or something greater. Now, since our proof has to read forward, we want x plus 2 to be less than what we replaced. In other words, on the previous line, we had something. We replaced it with absolute value of x plus 2. And because that was smaller, we maintained the inequality. So we'll use the upper bound 5 in the previous line. So we assumed x was between 1 and 3. And in this interval, the absolute value of x plus 2 is less than 5. So if we had a 5, we could replace it with something smaller and maintain the inequality. And now let's take one last step backwards. And now the only difference between our two lines is that one has a delta and the other one has epsilon fifths. Again, if we want to replace a delta with epsilon fifths, because this is on the greater than side, we need to make sure that delta is less than epsilon fifths. Now, we typically make one last simplification. Note that if we pick a small enough epsilon, we'll be in this interval between 1 and 3. So we can replace this requirement with the fairly standard phrase, sufficiently small, and say that for sufficiently small epsilon, and delta less than epsilon fifths, we have absolute x squared minus 4 less than epsilon whenever x minus 2 is between 0 and delta. And that completes our proof.